I want to um, introduce Audrey Grazzi from Mental Health Referral, who is my who is my co-sponsor of this program. She's going to talk to you a little bit about what MHR does, and then we'll tell you about search and our presentation. Yeah, I just just We do our thing. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about MHR, Mental Health <coughs> Resource Division. Um, we help the community in a lot of different ways. We raise awareness about mental health. And uh, one of the things we do is we give referrals to all types of mental health professionals. Hi. Uh, that means therapists, psychiatrists, um, social workers, mental health uh, counselors. Um, we also do a lot of stuff like this, events and lectures. Uh, we also do support groups, which by the way, if anybody is interested in doing an anxiety support group, you could come see me after the lecture. I could put your name down and we could reach out to you when we get something like that started. Um, we also have a brand new program in MHR. It's the Fertility Program. We have a lot of resources and support um, within that program as well. We address things like sexual abuse and domestic violence at MHR. Um, and uh, basically anything that has to do with mental health. So. Enjoy today, and thanks, Mary. Thank you, Audrey. We we work a lot together. Um, a lot of times, she'll send someone to me. I'll send someone to her, and together, we're really able to cover a lot of bases for families. Um, so, what is the Lucille and Arthur Greenberg Search Program, which is the co-sponsor of this thing, this event? When your child is having trouble in school, we analyze the issues. We walk our parents through the Board of Ed process if that's the appropriate thing to do. We help you get services your child is entitled to under the law, and we figure out if you need something else. So we're great detectives, and we cover all the bases, whether it means sending to MHR for mental health referral, or a resource that they have, or finding other resources for you, we're able to figure that out. Our mission is to get your child through 12 years of school with both self-esteem and education intact. If we can get that for your child, we have succeeded. We also run programs that educate our community about different, different issues, educational <coughs> issues, learning styles. That's what this program is today. Um, we have a number of upcoming programs in the work. We're just waiting for one final uh, approval, and then we can let you know about it. So if you haven't signed in, and if you're not on our email list, put yourself on our, our email list. We have a ton of stuff that's available, including workshops. We can also cross-reference you to different types of, of, of programs that MHR is running. Um, actually, just finishing now is Tune Into Your Teens, which is a, for, for parents of teenagers, and that just happened to overlap us a drop today. A fabulous program run by one of our best social workers here. So there are a lot of things we have available. All you got to do is let us know. And if there are things that you would like us to do, let us know. The two programs that we're sitting on right now are programs that our parents said we want and we're starting pilot programs. Um, also, we need volunteers. How do we get this done? Volunteers, people who come and help us, people who come with ideas and say, hey, I've got 10 friends who need A, B, or C. If you're interested in volunteering, there's a sign-in sheet in the back. Just say, it says volunteers. I don't want you to make sure you sign into attendance. Um, but if you're interested in volunteering, let us know. We'll contact you, we'll get you, we'll find you a job. Um, there are also brochures and business cards. Now, to our program, okay? More and more parents, the, the thing that brought this program about was that more and more parents are calling about behavior in children. This is epidemic. And we really don't know why or how or what, but we do know that we have to address it. Our presenter, Esty Sachs, who runs Sensory Outlet here in Brooklyn and in Lakewood, right? Two sensory outlets. She's gonna talk about how anxiety can drive behavior and what we can do about it. Um, so she has an expertise in behavioral, motor, attentional issues, and how it presents in a child, anxiety, rigidity, aggression, difficulty, focusing, she's gonna go through all that stuff, okay? But this is her expertise. Uh, she presented for us several, uh, about two years ago, and we said we had to have her back. We just had to have her back. Thank <laughs> you. So thank you very much for thank coming you. back. Without further ado, as Thank says. you. Well, thank you for having me here. Um, let's hope I don't bore you today, and let's hope I can stay organized here. So if I lose you somewhere along the way, please tell me. Um, I think that the information can get a little bit convoluted at times. Um, I try to lay it out as organized as I can on the slide so it organizes me, so I can organize you, um, but I'm going to need your help here. 
Um, I'll give you a little bit of a background just on myself. Um, I'm an occupational therapist. Um, I came this way through a very, very um, interesting route. I initially wanted to go into the mental health field um, and somehow landed up in OT school. I still can't quite figure out how. And um, thank God we'll be finishing a degree in um, licensed mental health counseling um, very soon. So I kind of did this backwards. I did the OT work. Um, we work a lot with mental health issues and behaviors in children. We work a lot with parenting, with attachment, all pieces that we will touch upon in today. Um, and then finally decided it was time to go back and get my second degree. So that's, that's where I am. This is what I work with all day. Um, I work with it with the children that we see. Um, and if I can say, I have one of my own that has been through the process um, and thank God has emerged successfully, um, but we've been through this as parents as well. So I come, I come at this from both ends. Um, and I think that one of the things that I really, really, really hear a lot is anxiety, right? My child is anxious, my child is anxious, my child is anxious, my child's aggressive, my child can't focus, my child's all over the place, I'm anxious, my husband's anxious, everybody's anxious, right? That's kind of, and I think that we can all relate with that. And before we even talk about what is anxiety, what does it mean, how does it present, I just want you to look at numbers for one minute, just to realize how, um, really how prevalent this is. Well, we'll go back to that. So first of all, 40 million adults in the United States, 18.1% of our population struggles with anxiety. And that's only diagnosed anxiety. How many of us have anxiety that's not formally diagnosed, right? Think about that. Think about how prevalent it is. How many people struggle with it? 30% of children and teens, that's a huge number, struggle with diagnosed anxiety. That's more than one in 20 children. That means go into a classroom that has 30 children and you're going to have at least one and a half children, right? So I guess two children that are gonna have anxiety. And that's formally diagnosed anxiety. How many children have undiagnosed anxiety that either we see and we know what it is or we see and we don't know what it is? Um, and that's 2.6 million children in 2011, 2012. And they say that that number has one and a half times itself by now. So look at that, we're over 4 million children in today's day and age, in 2019. That's a huge number. Now let me ask you a question, I know you have the slides in front of you, this is why I hate using slides, but what is anxiety? It's, it's kind of like this term that we throw around all the time, what is it? Come on, help me out. Someone? Stress. What? Nerves. Stress. Nerves. What else? Stress. Stress. What else? When you think anxiety, you think? Okay, behavior. Panic attack. Danger, danger. Panic attack, what else? Yeah. Um, inability to cope. Physical symptoms. Okay. Physical symptoms. Yeah. Inability to cope, right? Think about all these terms we just threw out. Stress, nerves, danger, inability to cope, panic attack, physical symptoms, Someone right? Someone cannot focus. Hmm? Someone that cannot focus. Someone who can't focus. Right? So think about all these symptoms that we're thinking of when we think of anxiety when it comes to ourselves as an adult. Now let's take that and put those symptoms into a child who can't make sense of their thoughts or their emotions and has to sit in class all day and focus. And listen to a bunch of adults and follow all these rules and have to toe the line and fit into the box. Right? What's that going to give us? Even more anxiety. A mess. So anxiety's formal definition is the body's natural response to stress. So you think, now it may be and it may not be, you think you perceive danger. You see something that you think may be harmful to you, whether it's emotionally, whether it's physically, whatever it is, and your body's natural reaction to that danger is anxiety. What's the purpose of anxiety? To keep us safe. Right? So can you imagine if you were walking outside at 3 o'clock in the morning? I think this is the famous example that I use only because I can relate to it. Right? So I remember when we were going back a number of years ago, um, we had moved apartments and it, we literally had finally fi uh, finished unpacking. I'm like one of these people where I move in and I can't go to sleep till my apartment's unpacked. We moved in, I unpacked, about 3.30 in the morning I finally finished that last box. Um, I had a two-year-old and a newborn, we're going back quite a number of years ago, a two-year-old and a newborn, and I walked outside to bring that, those boxes out to the garbage, right, because that's what you want to do at 3.30 in the morning. Don't ask me, I did it. And I walk outside to the front, we were like, we were, we were in the basement of a house that was really set back, 
And I'm walking down this long pathway and I'm going at 3.30 in the morning. It's really quiet, it's really still. And I put the garbage down, you know, the box is down by the garbage and I heard a thump. And I cannot tell you how I jumped and screamed so loud. I thought, when I, my husband's like, is everything okay? I hope I didn't wake the neighbors. You know, it was like that kind of like, I, I, I physically jumped. It was like, oh my goodness, what was that? Okay, I turned around, it was a cat. Okay, and I went back inside. But that's, that's what it is, that's your response. I heard a sound, right, and it went, what if that's a person? I don't know, what if that's something that's dangerous? And my body's natural reaction was anxiety, stress. And when I came back inside, my heart was thumping, I had a headache, my heart was pounding, I was shaking. I was like, all right, I'm going to sleep, I'm out, I'm done. So think about that, that's what anxiety is. So anxiety, if you look at, we're gonna get this a little bit later, get to this a little bit later, but if you look at the brain, and I'm gonna use my hands for this, I have to put the mic down, but if you, if you kind of, if you put your hands up like this, so put your thumbs in your fist, okay? Close your fingers over and put, sorry. I got it. It's good for sensory overload, if you wanna know what it feels like. Um, and put your fingers together. This is your brain, okay? Your brain is made up of three parts. The bottom part, this is the bottom part, okay? And let's open our brain for a minute, right? So we have right, right side of our brain and left side of our brain, right? Right side, left side. We also have top and bottom. So now if you look at my hands, the bottom part of our brain is what we call our animal brain. It's our reactive brain. That's the part of our brain that keeps us safe. It's the part of our brain that cries out if there's danger. That's the bottom part of our brain. The top part of our brain, which is your fingers right here, is your logical system, your cortical system. This is logic. Logic, reason. This is the part of us that we'd like to think we are all the time. And if you open up your hands, okay, now you have this, your thumb is what we call your amygdala, a big part of your emotional response system. Okay, a lot of memory sits in there, emotional memory. And then this, the rest of it is the rest of our emotional system, what we call our limbic system. This is our brain in a nutshell. We need all parts of our brain to work in tandem to make sense of the information that's coming in, right? So, and we're gonna get back to this model later. We're gonna get back to it when we describe what happens when information comes in that feels unsafe. And we're gonna get back to this model when we talk about, okay, what can I do with my child to help calm them down in the moment, to help address it in the moment? So kind of put that on hold. Now, we all feel anxiety at different times, right? How many of you, have ever felt anxiety? <laughs> right? Um, how many of you haven't? Isn't that amazing? Not a single hand? Now, sometimes anxiety actually is what we need to get us through the moment. It's appropriate. Anxiety is not a bad thing if it's appropriate. But how many of us have felt anxiety when it wasn't per se what we should have felt? Right? and think about how you feel. So I know when I get anxious, it hits me in my stomach. I can't eat, I lose my appetite, you know, and no one would ever know, but I have a sour stomach, right? Think about ways that you feel anxiety. Come on, help me out. Other symptoms. Racing thoughts. Racing thoughts, what else? Heart palpitations. Palpitations, I heard someone say headache, right? Yeah, headache, what else? Nausea, running to the restroom, what else? Dizzy, tension, right? You hear all these symptoms? And think about these symptoms are in your body, right? Wait a minute. I had a parent who asked me, I thought anxiety is in here. I said, no, no. You can't separate your mind and your body. Your mind and your body are one. If something's going on up here, it's going on in here, right? And why is that? because really all this is, this is my brain. That's really all it is. The way my brain works is I take an information through my body, from my world, and the information travels through my body into my brain, and my brain just helps me make sense of it. But think about where I'm taking in that information. I'm not taking it in through my brain, I'm taking it in through my body, through my five senses, or if you're an OT, through my seven senses, right? So through sight and sound and smell and taste and touch and movement, and your deep sense of touch. It's what we call proprioception, your sense of where my body is. That's how we take in information. So you have your body and you have your, your mind, your emotions, okay? 
One of the other things that you're going to see is, and I'm going to kind of, those of you that have met me know that I say this, but think about if you've had a really stressful day, right? So kind of close your eyes, think about that day, put yourself in the moment, and come home. Or, you know, let's change this up. Think about a day where you had a really, really great day that went really well, okay? And you come home, and you have all your kids come running up at you, screaming at the same time. Your husband snaps at you, but you had a really fantastic day. Really, really fantastic day, right? How are you going to respond to them? You're on a high. I don't know what happened. You, I don't know, won the lottery. I don't know, <laughs> right? How are you going to respond to them? So picture yourself, you're really happy, you're feeling great, you're feeling awesome, you're feeling successful, you're feeling happy, you come inside and all your kids come, Mommy! they're all doing it at the same time, and your husband, why are you so late, right? Well, what's your response going to be? Happy. Right? Responsive. All right, what's going on, guys? How can I help you? Oh, you're fighting? Come, let's go to the supply room together. Oh, oh you know what? I actually ordered your favorite dinner, right? And you're going to be able to deal with it. True or not true? Okay, let's take the other scenario. You have a really rough day, really rotten day. Okay, you get in the car, your coffee spills all over you, you're late to the appointment that you need to get to, you come in, they don't let you see the doctor or the therapist or whoever you're waiting to see, you come out, your baby's screaming, um, you get stuck in traffic, somebody rear ends you, I don't know, you come home, you get a call from school that your, your kid needs to be picked up, they're misbehaving, they're sick, they're this, they're that, you walk in and everybody jumps on you. Same exact scenario. What's your response going to be? Leave me alone. Say that again. You're going to blow up. What else? You're going to cry. Leave me alone. What else? Walk out the door. <laughs> or it's like, oh yeah, this is, this is the kind of greeting I get when I get home. Go to the playroom. Be quiet. Don't say a word. I got to go up to my room. And if anybody bothers me for the next two hours, you're going to hear about it. Right? <laughs> kind of sounds something akin to what we do. Right? So, but think about it. Same exact scenario. It's the same situation. What changed? You. you. Your internal feeling. What changed was your internal system, right? Your feelings of stress. In one situation, you weren't stressed. So, it's like we say, it's like a thermometer. Your thermometer was down to 10, and you have up until 100 until it explodes. You have 90% space. And the other one, your thermometer was at 99. Just by walking through the door and thinking about what you're going to deal with, you were already exploding. Right? And that's how we think of our body. That's how we think of anxiety. And in a sense, that's how we think of kids. Okay? And again, let's shelve that piece with kids and we're going to get to it in a second. But when we say the anxiety, stomach ache, the fast heart rate, fast and shallow breathing, that you all understand. Right? When we say decreased, sensit uh, decreased sensitivity to stimuli, to sensory input, Decreased tolerance to sensory input. Think about it. It's the same scenario. Everyone was screaming. It was the same noise. It was the same everybody jumping on you. The same touch. The same movement. The same all that. In one situation, you dealt with it. And in another situation, you couldn't. Make sense? Right? Same way it is with kids. A child who's anxious cannot deal with their environment. A child who's anxious cannot deal with sound and touch and taste and smell and movement and everything like that. Okay, and a child who's anxious, the more your kids scream and the more they bother you when you're trying to kind of self-regulate yourself, the more you're going to explode. The more you give them, the more anxious they get. The more anxious they get, the less they tolerate. The less they tolerate, the more anxious they get. Following the cycle? It's a beautiful cycle. Right? And it makes so much sense when you think about it. If we understand the mechanisms, the why behind what they're saying. As adults, we communicate through language. Right? Or hopefully we communicate through language. Our tone of voice might be a different story. But we're using words. Think about with children. How do they communicate? With signs. With signs. With? Actions. Beautiful. Behavior. Actions and behavior. So when a child is jumping around, and interacting nicely, you know that they're feeling good about themselves, that they had a good day. When a child's aggressive and angry and non-compliant, and I hate the word non-compliant because they're not doing it purposely. When a child can't do what you want them to do, when they can't act the way that we expect them to act, they're telling you something is wrong. In big, neon, bright, flashing signs, something is wrong. 
And what's not going to help is to just scream at them and squash them into the mold that we need them to. We need to figure out a way to get to the bottom of it. And it's not always easy to pinpoint the exact thing, but what can help is the way that we respond to them. And when we understand the why behind the behavior, if we understand that they're not doing it purposely, and they're not doing it because they want to annoy me, and they're not doing it because they just want to be difficult and they don't want to listen. When we understand that and we really understand it, even when we're stressed in the moment, it can change our responses to them because we start to feel bad for them. They're struggling with something. Wouldn't it be nice if we were upset and we came home, we're having a really rough day, and the kids come running here and they all realize, hey, wait a second, mommy had a rough day. And they all back off quietly and go, mommy, go to your room. Do you want something to eat? Take the night off. Wouldn't it be nice if our kids did that? Mm -hmm. Right? How would we feel? Great. I'll make dinner. Your husband's like, oh, go out to the spa. I'll take care of everything. Right? How would that be? It's amazing. <laughs> It'd be awesome. Right? Welcome to Fantasy Island. But here's the thing. We have to give Fantasy Island to our kids. Because when they're experiencing this, we're the adults in the situation. We may not feel like it, but we are. You know? When people ask me, <laughs> when people ask my mother how old she is, she goes, what do you mean? I'm still turning 18. Yeah. Until one of the grandkids went, you know, Safi, you turned 18 last year, and you turned 18 the year before and the year before. <laughs> You're at least 21. <laughs> She's like, all right, I'll take 21. Okay, now, let's look at this. Yeah. There's something that we call reflexes. Okay, a little bit of information overload. Stop me if you get there. Because to me, this is kind of like everyday language already. <laughs> but, okay, so turn your brains on, and let's, let's focus and try and power through this so you understand it. You know when a baby and a newborn, right, and we have some babies around that we can even test it on. You know how you put your finger in their hand, and what do they do? They grasp you, right? Tell me, what's the thought process behind that? There is none. Right? Take a one-week-old baby. I, I guarantee you not. The process is not this. You put their finger in, your finger in their palm, and they're going, mm, do I want to grasp that? Do I not? No, I don't think so. Right? No, that's not what's going on. You touch it, they grasp. You stroke them on their cheek, and what do they do? They root whether they like to or not. Now, the hungrier they are, the more they're going to root, right? You make a loud sound. You ever see this? You make a loud sound and? They startle. <laughs> they startle, right? What happens if you pick a baby up and you forget a newborn that they don't hold their head up? They can't hold their head up. Do I really need the mic? Can I talk without it? Do we really need yeah? the mic? How fast? Okay, back there she says no, so we're good. Okay, awesome. Can you hear me? Okay, so what happens, you know, you know like a newborn, you pick their baby, the baby up and you forget sometimes, especially when you have like a two-year-old or a three-year-old or a four-year-old before, that they don't hold their head up and their head drops back. Do you ever see what it looks like? And what do they do? Like that, right? Now listen to my breath for a minute. This is what they do. That's what we call the startle response, okay? Now, the baby's not thinking, oh, she dropped my head, okay, startle, wait, startle, here we go, breathe, arms, okay, here we go. No, it's automatic, it goes like this, right? You touch, they respond, you make a sound, they respond like this, automatic. And those are the key words when it comes to a reflex. A reflex is automatic. Now, the purpose of these reflexes that are there in an infant is for safety and protection. This is the way a baby enters this world. And when they enter this world, their brain knows one thing. I need to get my needs met. How? Dunno. I need to get fed. I need to get love. I need to get taken care of. That's all they know. And it's not a logical process. Remember that picture of the brain that we had before with your hands? When a baby's born, the only part of the brain that works, that's online, is your animal brain. The part of your brain that cares about safety and survival. And the way that they get their needs met is through these reflexes. You stroke their cheek, and the baby's brain goes, oh, there must be food. Right? You drop their head back, and the baby goes, oh, I must be falling. Catch myself. You make a loud sound, and the baby goes, oh, that must be danger. You put your finger in their hand, and the baby goes, ah, oh, that must be a safety figure. And that's what the purpose of the reflexes are. Now get this, though. The reflexes are wonderful. They're great. They're really, really a gift. But here's the problem. As the baby gets older, have you ever seen a one-year-old that 
Do you put the finger, your finger in their palm and they grasp you as tightly as a newborn does? Anyone? I have, but that's only because I evaluate them. Right? No, it shouldn't be. Do you ever see a baby wear a one-year-old where you stroke their cheek and they're rooting? No. Right? These reflexes, these automatic responses, as a baby starts to get older and starts to realize, the brain starts to realize, hey, my needs are being met. My world is safe. Ah. The brain starts to say, you know what automatic things that are here to keep me safe? I don't really need you because I am safe. My environment is safe. Bye-bye. See you never. You get it? And those automatic reflexes become not automatic. We don't like completely get rid of them. They kind of get stored up here, very top part of the brain. And if you ever really run into a situation that's really full of danger, the reflexes will come back out to help you if you can't do enough for yourself, right? But that's kind of the idea. And the beauty of these responses are that as they move away and they become not automatic, the baby starts to develop and to blossom and they start to learn skills, and they start to pick their head up and roll over and grasp toys and put them in and put them out and stand and walk and crawl. But we need these automatic things to move on. Can you imagine if every time I picked up a pencil and it touched my hand, it went like this? That'd be pretty challenging. If every time I heard any sounds in, my, in the room, <laughs> I went like this, right? What would that do to me? I, I wouldn't be able to function. Make sense? Mm -hmm. What about our children, though, that for whatever reason, and we'll get into the reasons in a minute, but for whatever reason, these reflexes have not been able to move on. They're stuck. There are a four-year-old and a five-year-old and a six-year-old with three-month-old reflexes, three-month-old skills. So they walk into a room that's too loud, and <gasps> they're startling. Now, we may not see the full <gasps> in them, but you know what's happening? I see this. <laughs> Tantrum. Meltdown, right? They're moving into that startle response. And what happens if every time in a, in, in, in a child, in a four-year-old, they turn their head and they go out like this? That's what a newborn does. You turn their head and they move like this. It's what we call the ATNR. It's right brain, left brain connection, right? And I see this all the time. The kid is sitting at the table writing something, and he turns his head this way to look at the other side of the paper, and all of a sudden our hands are moving out like this. How can you function in a classroom setting. You following me? Yeah? Make sense? Questions so far? Yeah, go ahead. Are you telling us not to baby them? No, on the contrary. We're going to have to baby them. We have to baby them to meet their needs. I feel like if you baby them more, the more dependent they become, and then they get scared and social. Mm -mm. And then I think that that's a very, very common misconception about it. When we we need to be in tune to them, and we'll talk about the attunement in a minute. We need to meet their needs and make them feel safe and comfortable, and they are babies. They do need our help. They're so little. But that's where we need to set limits. That's boundaries. Where we have to start to understand, okay, what's the why? Are they just doing this, eh, because they know last time they got a candy, they want a candy? Or is it really because they're so anxious inside and there's so much going on inside? But it's a good question, and we'll get to that. We'll get to that towards the end. You'll see that at the end, okay? So, yeah. When you have a child that does this all the time, how would you, what would you do to stop it? Good question. When you have a child that's kind of tense and all the time, what would you do to stop it? And that is a whole another lecture for another time. <laughs> but I will give you things at the end that you can do just yourself how to regulate them emotionally in the moment, how to respond in the moment. That, that we'll get to at the end, and we'll practice that. Yeah? So the children that are ages five and six that are now reacting as if they were a two-month-old, is that just biologically that's how they are? They were born? Is that, is that what Ah, is? our next slide. Fantastic question. So those children that are, that are five, four and five and six and seven that are reacting that way, that their, their bodies are kind of in line of that as an infant, right? And, and when I say in an infant, you know, you're kind of thinking, well, my five and six-year-old is walking. How does this make sense? You know, they figure out ways to compensate. The problem is that it leaves holes. Do you, do you get what I mean? 
it just kind of leaves holes in the foundation. And there's just so long that you can push yourself and push yourself and push yourself before it just all starts to crumble and you're like, all right, this is too much. And that's what we see a lot with kids. But is it biologically or is it something else? And the answer is, we'll get to it on the next slide, but it's both. And we'll get to it, okay? So the fight or flight response, I'm going to talk about two of those reflexes only today. One is what we call the fight or flight response, and one is what we call the freeze. We go into, when we're anxious, we're going into fight or flight. Fight or flight response is exactly as it sounds. Something that I think is dangerous, whether it's actually dangerous or not, whether it's my brother or sister tapping me on the shoulder, whether it's my mother looking at me the wrong way, or what I think is the wrong way, or whether it truly is something that's dangerous. God forbid a car accident or something, the adrenaline and the anxiety and the tension and the stress and those overwhelmed feelings that you get are what we call your fight or flight response. Can I just add something? Yeah. Um, when you say anxiety, is it also anger? Can you come out as anger? Yes. Fire? And when we get to the red flags, we'll get there. Absolutely. Right? Anger is usually that I'm full to my limits and it just, the cover blows. And that is fight. That's the fight of the flight response. Think about the fight or flight response. What are you gonna do? You're either gonna fight the danger, right? Scream at them, blast them, kick them, hit them, throw them, do whatever you can to get it out of your way, or flight, get me out of here. Make sense, mm -hmm. right? Think about all that adrenaline that courses through your system when you're anxious. That is what we call, by the way, in a baby, just technical, what we call the Moro reflex, M-O-R-O, -O, it's up there. It's also known in an adult as a startle response. If you go home and you Google the Moro reflex in a newborn, you will see there are videos that show, you know, a parent holding a baby's head or a doctor holding a baby's head and they take their, the hand away and the head drops and they go into a full-blown moro. The fight or flight response and the freeze responses, freeze is kind of like a whole new level. Freeze is, I can't fight, I can't flight, I'm so overwhelmed, forget it. Pray I survive, come and get me. That's freeze. Okay, so freeze is kind of like, a more extreme form. Now, for us as parents, I have to say, and as teachers, the freeze response is much easier to deal with. Why? Because the kids withdraw, they get quiet, very docile, kind of whatever you want, sure, no problem. So it's much easier for us to deal with. But the thing is, is that really it, their system is so, so anxious and so beyond that it's worse for the child. When we work with them in therapy and we say, as we move through the freeze response, and we bring it down and we make it less, we're moving into fight or flight, right? Because we said fight or flight is kind of like less anxiety than freeze. You're going to see some aggression come out and some anger come out. And the parent's like, no, I don't want that. I say, when you see that, you know it's a good sign. And then we work through that. So when you look at these, this is the adrenaline to fight or flight to save ourselves. You can feel it in your body. Again, your heart rate, your breathing rate. Um, it can be caused by a loud sound or a sudden movement, or it could be caused by a feeling of not, of not being safe. And this is, this is what we mean. The reflexes are physical, right? We got that? It's a physical movement. It's physical. It's in our body. Our heart rate goes up. That's physical. Our, we start to breathe really fast and shallow. That's physical. Our stomach ache is physical. Our headache is physical. Now, this physical response can be caused by either of two things. Either or, or both. It could be caused by an actual danger or a perception of danger, whether it's something emotionally that happened to us, right? Thoughts that are going on in our head, it can be emotional, and it can be caused by something from our environment. So it can cause, be caused by something in our head, internal, or something external. And the something external can be sound, movement, touch, touch is more freeze, but touch, that's where you get to the sensory systems. So you understanding how our environment affects the way we respond. Our environment affects our anxiety. Our environment affects our body. Our body will react either to things going on inside. I'm thinking about something. I'm worried about something. I'm concerned about something. <gasps> I start to feel it in my stomach. My heart rate goes up. I'm jittery. I'm just not present. I'm overwhelmed, right? Or it can be caused by, I'm really OK. I don't know. I come home, and th the noise is just way too overwhelming and it's too much for me. And then I start to get anxious, and then I start to crumble and fall apart. You following? Makes sense. Can you see this like in your own lives? Can you see this when you think about yourself or your kids, right? So this is what we see. Now, let me get to the next part. Um, okay, we really did that. 
let's talk about symptoms. Now, let's talk about some of our responses when we get anxious. What happens? Let's think about fight or flight, kind of like that adrenaline coursing through our body. What are, what are some of our responses? Scream, yell, what else? <coughs> hmm? Withdraw. Withdraw, okay. That's freeze, yep. <coughs> what else? Okay, shortness of breath, heart palpitations, yes, that's more the body. Let's talk our responses, what we're doing. Can't sleep, what else? Huh? We eat, what else? Yeah, I like that one. It is. Chocolate. Huh? We get agitated, what else? Okay, how about this? We cry. How about this? Okay, you had an extremely stressful day. Everything went wrong. Anyone ever had one of those days? Right, okay, everything went wrong. And your husband comes home and he says, guess what? There's this awesome lecture tonight that you're coming to, three hour lecture. Right? <laughs> what are you gonna be, what are you gonna say? I'm not going, why? You just can't handle anything else. Can't handle anything else. What about this? Anyone here, um, let's transplant ourselves back into either college or 12th grade. You had a really, really, really rough day. Think about now. And you got to go in and take a test, three-hour final. How are you going to perform? You're not, right? Make sense? Why? You shut down. You can't focus. How can you focus? So while us as adults, we have the ability to get up, move around. We're in control of our own lives. Nobody's telling us what to do, right? I want to eat the chocolate. I'm going to eat the chocolate. I want to have my fifth ice cream. I'm going to eat my fifth ice cream. I want to go upstairs and blast music, I'm going to blast music. I want to stay up till 5 a.m., I'll stay up till 5 a.m., right? I'm the adult. How about our kids? I want a chocolate, no chocolate, now it's supper. I want a chocolate, no chocolate, now it's supper. I want ice cream, no ice cream, now it's supper. But I want ice cream, but I said no ice cream! <laughs> and what's the kid feeling? Orange. Up to here. Right? We have the ability to control ourselves, but with kids, it comes out as defiance. It comes out as not listening. Let's take this to school. Let's look at these symptoms. It comes out as aggression. They feel like their whole world is dangerous. So when their sibling comes at them and wants to ask them a question, and the sibling comes this much too close, instead of them just backing away and saying, you're coming too close, what happens? Pop. Punch in your nose. <laughs> right? And now the, that, was, that wasn't controllable, right? The kid is feeling anxious. <laughs> he, it's his perception. He sees the whole world as dangerous. So the kid coming at me is not to ask me a question. It's to come take something of mine, to provoke me. Boom, punch. And what does mommy say? Is that what we say? Do we say, oh, why'd you do that? No. <laughs> what do we say? Come on. Why'd you hit him? Why'd you hit him? <laughs> What's wrong with you? Don't you know there's no hitting in the house? <laughs> right? I think we're all guilty of this. And I'm talking to myself included. We're all guilty. Come on. Right? We're humans. <laughs> Right? Let's look at the other thing. Difficulties with limit setting. You say no, and he says, but I want. Right? I'm thinking about a tantrum that we had last night. Oh, my goodness. Um, my five-year-old, my almost five-year-old, wanted a specific nightgown. Here's the problem. The nightgown was in the laundry after wearing it, like, literally five nights in a row. Okay? So she wore it. I washed it. She wore it. I washed it. She wore it. I washed it. I'm like... And last week, you wouldn't look at the nightgown. So this week, you need this nightgown. And I'm like, listen, my love, <laughs> um, mommy did laundry like five times this week. I'm not doing it again. So you can either wear dirty pajamas, that has the stain on it, um, after your fresh bath, or you can choose another pair of pajamas. And you should have heard what went on in my house, OK? <laughs> we had a royal meltdown. I mean, like, it was the ice cream with the sprinkles and the cherry on top. That was, and it lasted for a long time. So now. I guess I could say, me doing what I do, right? I came in with all those skills, you know, all equipped. And I'm validating her, and I'm talking calmly to her, and I'm making that eye contact. And we'll talk about all these things. We're all going to practice with partners. So one of you is going to get to be a kid, and one of you is going to get to be the mommy, and then you'll switch. Um, but she wanted her nightgown. There was nothing doing. At a certain point, I went to the laundry. I pulled it out. I said, honey, you want your nightgown? Here, go to sleep. She took her nightgown, she didn't put it on. It has a stain! I'm like, I told you that 20 minutes ago. But I want you to wash it! My husband's like, okay, this is like completely, like, what happened? 
And I called her mower that and I said, I don't know. I, she's been having a really rough two weeks and she's been doing so well. What's going on? She goes, well, actually, you know, there's a girl in the class that really bothers her. I'm like, oh, I feel so bad that I didn't give her her nightgown. I should have washed her nightgown for her, you know, right? Okay, and that's mommy's guilt that comes in. When she woke up in the morning, I went over to her and I said, I'm so sorry that mommy got annoyed last night. Mola told me that there's a girl in your class that's bothering you. And we went into a whole fresh set of tears. But at least this time I knew what it was, right? So what I saw as stubborn resistance, and my husband's going, my husband's Mr. Softy, and he's the one who's going, nope, you gotta listen, you gotta set those limits, you gotta set those limits. And I'm just like, I, we've been doing bedtime for two hours. I'm gonna get to bed, right? It's 9.30 at night, the kid's five, not even. You gotta set those limits. She couldn't listen to my limits, why? She had something else on her mind. She was completely overwhelmed. Go on a diet while you're, being, while you're beyond stressed. Are you going to succeed? No. Okay? So that's difficulties with limit setting. They're going to push limits. They're going to push limits at home and in school. How about hyperactivity? Right? Mm. Hyperactivity is, think about the fight and the flight and the freeze. Which one do you think it is? Okay, I could see that. Flight. They're all over the place. When we get restless and we get antsy and we get fidgety, right, we can take care of it on our, on our own. Right? We're adults. Constantly. When kids get restless and antsy and fidgety, they're hanging from your ceilings. Like escape, escape, escape. Literally. I mean, wherever I can go, right? Get me out of here. And that's what it looks like. Hyperactivity in a child. I have so many parents that ask me, is it ADHD? And I say, listen, I can't tell you if it's ADHD or not. What I can tell you, and this comes from a child who's really anxious, you know, meaning when I'm looking at a child who's really anxious, I say, what I can tell you is this child is really, really, really anxious. Their body's not up to where they want it to be, and they're very anxious, and you can't separate the two, so each one is feeding into the other. The anxiety is making their body not work properly. It's stopping up those reflexes and the, and the development, and their development is making them even more anxious because they're not successful. So that's, and then the more anxiety is, right? You see that? The two go hand in hand. You can't always find a cause. Sometimes you can, you can't always. And you say like this, so is it ADHD or anxiety because my kid's hanging from the rafters? I can't tell you. I can tell you that kids with anxiety present with ADHD symptoms. That's what I can tell you. And once we address the anxiety, and once we get their body up to par, I can tell you if there's an ADHD aspect. Because ADHD is a neurochemical thing in the brain. Right? So let's, let's go back to all these symptoms, restlessness. Meltdowns, oh my goodness, that's one of the biggest ones. I can't tell you how embarrassing it is when I'm in the store. And they were like, and everywhere I turn, you know, there are people who know me. And then, oh, my five-year-old has meltdown on the floor. Why? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe my seven-year-old touched her the wrong way. Could be. Right? Or at least that's what it was like. That's much better now. But literally, it was wherever we went. Right? We're going to the store. Ah, why are we going to the store? Okay, we're not going to the store. Ah, why are we not going to the store? <laughs> right? So think, but think about our kids with meltdowns. So that's meltdowns. Trouble concentrating. How many of you here can concentrate really well when you are super anxious and you have all these physical symptoms and all these thoughts racing through your heads and you are anxious to kazoo? None of us. How can our kids concentrate in school? They can't, okay? Difficulty falling asleep. Yes, yes, yes. Again, how many of us here have ever had a hard time falling asleep because we're anxious, right? Okay? Um, difficulty with transitions. Do you want to go and try a whole new thing that's going to provoke anxiety when you're already anxious? No. I'll do exactly what I'm doing, whether it's working or not, because it's familiar for me. Make sense? Okay. What about poor frustration tolerance? So we, I think that we look at it as poor frustration tolerance, but really what's going on, if you take a cup of milk, okay, and fill it up 90%. And you know sometimes when the bottle is really full, like too much comes out when you pour it. You know what I mean, right? You like to pour. So take, do that in a cup that's 90% full. Where's the milk gonna go? To the top. Where? All over. It's not gonna go in your cup. Your cup's gonna go to the top, it's gonna go all over. That's a child who is dealing with all of this, and then we call it poor frustration tolerance. You're right, it is poor frustration tolerance because they're up to here. So if we had one of our, the, the clinical director of our social work department in Lakewood, she said it in such a great way. I was sitting with her in a meeting yesterday, and she said, I try to explain to kids, some kids will come in, and, and, and they'll start working, and then all of a sudden they're crying, and the kid will go, I'm not even sad, and they're crying, she goes, you're right, you're not sad. 
but you're up to here and it just started to come out of your eyes because that's the only place it can go. Right? It's such a great way to explain it. And that's really what it is. So they're up to here, they're up to their noses, and you add some more and they just can't handle it. It just spills over. Pour your full cup, your, your, your milk, where you pour too much into a cup that's mostly empty. Is it gonna go all over? Probably not. Maybe a drip, if you really pour too hard too much, right? Um, preference to play alone, doesn't that make sense? Right, everybody is bothering me. My world is too much. My world is too anxiety provoking. My world is too intense. I'd just rather be with me, because you know what? I'm safe. Because if I do something to myself, I know exactly what to expect, because I'm the one who's doing it. If somebody else does something to me, I don't know what to expect. You don't want to go into a situation where you have no idea what you're going to expect. It's a complete surprise when you're anxious. Let me know exactly what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, and don't change it a bit. And if you do, you'll hear about it from me. Right? That's what we are as adults. Let's just put this right back into kids. Um, withdrawing, which is freeze, and they can be anxious to please, which is also freeze. Okay, causes of anxiety. Here we go. And somebody asked a question before, and this goes to your answer. <laughs> go ahead. Should we come back to it? Yeah? Okay, causes of anxiety. You know that whole like controversy, the, the, the nature versus nurture controversy, right? So is it nature, is it nurture? Guess what, I have a little secret for you. It's both. Which one is more? Depends what's going on, I can't tell you. Some kids have a predisposition towards anxiety. Some kids have a predisposition towards weakness and developmental delay, which will make it harder for them to succeed, make it harder for them to take those reflexes and move them on, right? Now, I'm, I'm not, if anyone has a question on that, I can, I can answer it later. I don't want to put it in here because I think it's, it's just going to kind of confuse you, but there's an answer to it, to why. So some children have a tendency. Some children don't have a tendency, but they're born, and they're born at 27 weeks, and they go through three months of the NICU, and, and procedures, and prodding, and pricking, and of course their system's going to be overwhelmed, right? That's a part of nurture. That's a part of environment. So we have our nature, and we have our nurture. You can have, and if you look at the word trauma, right, how many of you here have either heard about something about trauma lately? Because it's, it's, you know, more and more research keeps coming out about it, right? What is trauma? Anyone know what that means? Give me the definition of the word trauma. Okay. When you go through an experience that causes something, okay. An upset. An upset. A shock to the body. What if I would say trauma has nothing to do with the thing that you went through? Has everything to do with the, your reaction to it, with what your body and your brain did to it? Make sense? Your thoughts, your, thoughts. your body, right? Your perception of it, your past history, your background, your tolerance, your day, your moment, your life. That's what it has to do with. You can have two people that go through the same exact thing and one will come out with PTSD, with trauma, and one won't. They'll be fine. You can have two children that grow up in the same exact family. One will have issues with it, and one won't. That's where you have nature playing into nurture. Okay? This is also, I'm going to answer it in one second, but this is where we also get to attachment. What does attachment mean? Go for it. Beautiful. Relationship between the parent and the child. That was beautiful. Think about our relationships with our children. Attachment starts at birth. The minute they give you that baby and put that, they put that baby on your chest, that's the first bonding moment. If we are anxious ourselves as parents, and if we're going through turmoil ourselves, how can we develop a beautiful, healthy, calm, nurturing bond with a child? And if anyone could answer that question, I'd give you a million dollars. You can't. And now, the truth is, is that we're all humans. We all go through our stuff. We all have our things, right? But it's a question of how much is it impacting our attachment with our children? That's the environment that they're growing up in. And you can have, if a child is in a home that's stressful, and they feel not understood, and there's a lot going on parenting-wise, right, and relationship-wise, and just things are, there's a lot going on, 
what kind of environment does that child, does that child's nervous system, does their brain feel like it's being brought up in? Help me out. Very stressful. stressful. And stress equals? Anxiety. Anxiety. Anxiety is the response to? Stress, stress or? <coughs> danger. Now, we're not talking danger as in like, oh yeah, they're dangerous, they're going to hurt me. No, no, we're not talking that way. Their system is responding in a way of, I am not getting what I need to feel fully calm and at ease. That's what we need. And that's where our attachment plays in. When you ask nature or nurture, it's both. What does the attachment between a parent and a child look like? What does the home look like? What's the child's tendency? If there's no tendency towards anxiety, there's no tendency towards delay, and the child is growing up in a house that's a mess, where there's so much going on, and the parent is having a hard time with that bond, and, and, and there's, there's just, parenting-wise, there's so much going, there are no limits, or there are too many limits, and, and, and there's shouting, and there's anxiety, and there's this, and there's that. If a child doesn't have that tendency, you know what? They'll come out with this much. But if a child's nature is that there's a tendency in their genetic makeup, they'll come out with this much. Is it genetic? There is a genetic component, yes. There's something called epigenetics, totally kind of like off. Whoever gets this, gets this, whoever doesn't, doesn't. There's something called epigenetics, and epigenetics is the evolution of our genes. And when you look at it over the generations, they say, why are children of Holocaust survivors so anxious? And their children, why is there so much more of a prevalence of anxiety today than there was 100 years ago? Now, a part of it is that there's the awareness. A part of it really is, is because of the trials and challenges that people go through, they have studies that show that their actual genetic makeup, their genes change. And what happens when you have children? You pass down those genes, right? It's in our genetic makeup. It's just... It's what it is. It's a part of what it is. And they've, they've identified it. So yes, nature and nurture. How much of a foundation do we have? And I want to um, give me one more second. I'll answer your question. Let's take a child who has a tendency towards developmental delay. A little weak, a little delayed. And they grow up, the, the attachment's not great. The parenting's not great. They come to school. They're being hounded over the head for it. I don't know. They're seen as the bad one, as the villain, as wrong, as this, as that. That child's foundation is so not strong, they're feeling so unsuccessful, what's that going to give us? A child who's anxious, a child who can't comply, a child who feels unsuccessful, has a poor self-esteem, right? Think about it. What's that going to make them do? You're going to have two types of children. Either fight or flight. It's what we call they're going to save face. They save face. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? You think I can't? I'm going to show you who's successful. Uh-huh. I'm just not going to listen. I'd rather be the class clown and the bad one as opposed to the stupid one, the lazy one, the dumb one. What about the freeze? The child who's the freeze is the, okay, whatever you say. Okay, whatever you say. Okay, whatever you say. Right? That's the freeze. Withdraws. Doesn't play with friends. It's always the last one. Is always lagging behind. But the child who's bright enough or the child who's, kind of in tune, who's picked this up early enough to realize, huh, this is what's going to happen to me? Oh, yeah, that's what you think? I'll show you what I think, right? And if you can address the underlying issue and have the child feel successful and have the child see that they can, what happens? That starts to fall away. And now you have a child who's more compliant and a child who can perform better. You know, one of the things, and this is kind of one of my pet peeves, one of my rants, one of the things that I have is, I find that so many people are always trying to find the cause, the cause. This is the one thing that if we find that one thing, we'll be able to fix it. Guess what? There is no cause. And don't kid yourself to think that there is one cause because there is no cause. It's a combination of everything. It's the whole child. It's like you coming in and saying, I'm having palpitations. I'm short of breath. And, and the doctor doesn't ask you about anxiety or about what's going on at home, and they say, oh, you must be having a cardiac issue. Let's put you, up, put you on cardiac meds, right? Hello, who are we kidding, right? And it works that way with children. A child can't focus. A child's impulsive. A child's aggressive in school. A child's not complying. And what does everyone scream? ADHD. Hey, ADHD, neurologist, right? Medicine. Now, sometimes we need the medication in the moment to help them through, but that's not the fix. You, got it. you could put a kid on medication, but if they don't, still don't have the underlying skills to be successful, it won't help them be successful. Does that make sense? Right? 
And this is, this is like, this is my mission. My mission is just to get everybody to understand that there are so many components that come into play. You got to take the whole child into account. Let me get to questions. I had a question here first and then to you. Go ahead. I just ahead. to clarify the yeah. epigenetics. Is it that in really actuality the ge the our genetic makeup is dwind dwindling down, like getting weaker? No. It's not that it's getting weaker. It's being altered. It's being altered. It's adjusting. It's a great word. It's adjusting. So it's not that, it's not that our genetic makeup is getting weaker, which was your question. It's adjusting to what's going on. It's trying to make us adaptable. It's almost like, I probably shouldn't say this in a room of, of uh, Jewish people here, but like evolution, right? right. And we, we look at evolution happened in a certain, we're not talking millions and millions and million, millions of years, but the evolution meaning that we change to ensure that we can survive. Well Survival of the fittest. Like because of these genes are adjusting, it just seems that every disorder under the sun is just more prevalent now. Things are more prevalent, A, because of awareness, that's A. Yeah. B, because we have sky high expectations for our child. Mm -hmm. We're putting them into the school system how young? I, my my, my three-year-old was expected to sit still, right? She was jumping out of her skin. Okay, now she's doing, I can't tell you what we put into her. What did we put into her? We put in, we're going on a year and eight months of twice a week therapy and we're still going strong. She's almost done, oh. right? Do you know how much went into her? And do you know how much, at a certain point I said, professional or not professional? You know what? I'm going to go and talk to someone to make sure that I'm doing things right for her. And I went to learn the skills that I needed for her. Now, it turns out these are the skills that we use in everyday sessions. So for me, I was like, all right, I know that. Great. As long as I know that I have what I need. As long as I know that I'm doing things right. But take a child like that, a three-year-old. you know what three-year-olds should be doing? Playing. Playing. Running up and down and rolling in the leaves. Mm -hmm. Right? That's what they should be doing. Yeah. Not sitting inside from 8.30 to 4. That's not what they should be doing. But that's our system. So take our expectations. Take our system. Take the awareness. And take the fact that, yes, over time, our genetic makeup does change. Look, just look at society. Look at social media. Look at the news. We're, we're, we're prevalent to every piece of information. How can we not have anxiety? It's a question of function versus dysfunction. At what point is it functional, and at what point is it not functional? That's our question. One second. I have one question for you. Go ahead. They could be a result, and right. they could be a cause. Are insecure so, and very shy and whatever, also have a lot of anxiety. Is it one because of the other? So, is one because of the other in terms of you're asking that their insecurities and their shyness and all that that goes back to is it does it provoke anxiety or is it a result of anxiety? That goes back to nature versus <laughs> nurture. What's their nature, and what's going on in their environment? And that will give you the mix up of what you have. It's not one answer. If someone's nature is to be shyer. If things are going on that's difficult for them, they're going to get even more shy and withdraw. That's going to be the result of their anxiety. People are introverts by nature. That's not per se anxiety. That's being an introvert. And our question becomes function versus dysfunction. Is it functional and we're being successful in our day and we're doing what we need to do, or is it dysfunctional? Are we having behaviors and meltdowns and we can't function and academically we're not doing well and socially we're not doing well? That's when it's dysfunctional. That's when we start to look, okay, wait, is this more than just nature of a person? Go ahead. Do you think that by us putting our children in school from so young, like you said, three years old, that we're indirectly causing this as opposed to letting them, like, they're getting, they're losing their self-esteem, their self-confidence because <coughs> the teacher's telling them, sit down, sit down, sit down. They, 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 are we doing wrong? It's a great question. It's a great question. And I'm going to repeat the question, but it's a question that's really, really, really hard to answer. Fantastic question. The question is like this. Are we doing them injustice by putting them into the school system so young? And here's the problem. This is the expectation in today's day and age. And we have to comply. We don't have a choice. This is what it is. The part that could change is on the part of the teachers and the schools to understand that a child is not bad. I have never met a bad child. I have never met a bad child. 
I can't say I've met a bad parent, but I've met a parent that's in the wrong. I've met a teacher who's really in the wrong. I've never met a child who's in the wrong, if you get my gist with that. We need to have more understanding, and the teachers have to have more understanding, rather than trying to take them and squish them into a box. I had a teacher who said to me recently, the child did something, and it's going back about three weeks ago. I was in another meeting. The child did something, a nine-year-old boy did something, and the teacher gave him a choice, like I told him to, and he wound up choosing the choice that had the consequence, meaning to, to actually do what he needed to do so as not to get the consequence. And I said to the teacher, so did you give him positive feedback after? And she goes, how could I? He didn't listen to me on the first time. He has to learn. And I said, for real? For real? Really? So here's the thing. Next time, A, who's the adult? And next time, guess what? You're going to give a child that choice. He ain't going to take that choice. He's going to take the other choice and rip down your things on your shelf. OK? If you give him that positive feedback, I know how hard that was for you. And you did that. You have to wow. validate them. Right? If you, yeah, you have to validate them. If you do that, you teachers know what? No, teachers are not. And you know what? The yeah, teachers, yeah, the teachers. few and far between teachers that are doing it are the ones that have successful students. Those are the ones where even the children who are struggling are doing well in their class. Right? And you see it all the time. So I want to get back to this for a minute. Nature versus nurture and the ability to be successful. I want you to create kind of like this, this cycle, this circle in your head. What time do I have until? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I officially want to stop. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I think we've already gone out to feed their meters. So, um, okay. So maybe, maybe we'll try to do 10 minutes. Uh, About 150. Could we do 115? We'll try. Okay. We'll try. Let, you know what? Can, can we do this? Um, can we, uh, I'm going to finish up on this part and get to the practical part. And then if you guys want more, meaning if you want me to go into it more for a few more minutes, you'll let me know. Okay? Is that, that okay? Okay. So here's, here's the thing. Try and create this kind of cycle in your head. So you have anxiety. You have feelings of not being, success, uh, not being successful. And you have a stressful environment. Okay? And e it's just this one big cycle. Do you see how each thing just kind of feeds into the other? Where does it start? Multiple places, all places, one place. I can't tell you. But at the end of the day, you have this cycle of a child who's anxious, who can't keep up, who's feeling unsuccessful, so he's more anxious, so he's more anxious. He goes home, things are more stressful. He's, he's, he's acting in a way to just let his stress out. And then he's not getting the responses that he needs to feel validated. So he feels even more anxious, which stops up his system even more, which slows down his development. The more slowed down his development is, the less he feels successful. Less he feels successful, less he can keep up, less he can uh, And he gets backlash for it. Do you see that? Do you kind of see that cycle? Yeah. How, do you end the cycle? How, do you fix it? How do you fix it? You got to come in and break the cycle. And there are a whole bunch of ways to come in and break the cycle. So let's get to, we spoke about attachment, tackling anxiety and its behavior. It's beautiful. This is where we're up to. So. Now, number one, I'm going to go to the second one first because it's a really, really quick comment. A calm down space. Um, I think everybody thinks of sensory regulation as, oh, sensory integration is like, oh, my kid is um, all over the place, so let's put him on a swing and swing them. And that is not what it is. I know many, I think many people, therapists, teachers, parents included, all think that that's what it is, and it's not what it is. So I'm going to use this as what I call a calm down space. I was going to call it a sensory space. I'm like, eh, that's really not what it is because if you have an anxious child, giving them a sensory space is not going to fix the issue. Right? We're going to call it a calm down space, a space at home that a child just feels like they can just be. They can go into, they can retreat, they have what they like, they have what they need. Sometimes this is used preventative, some before the moment. Sometimes this is used after the moment, once we've come in with all of our other techniques to calm them down and address the moment. But this is kind of their little space. And what I like to do and what I did with my own was we went to the store and we bought a bean bag. We bought a little tent, and we bought the books that she liked, and we bought her music, and we bought her this. And in her room, she has her little space. And when she gets really upset, um, at this point already, she goes up, where's Tehillah? Oh, she's upstairs. Right? OK. I mean, she had a really stressful day, and I can go up, and I can talk to her about it. Um, what it used to be was I first had to diffuse the moment, and then she was able to go upstairs and calm down. Right? So this is just kind of, it's, it's healthy. It's a very healthy little space. She was clawing everyone's eyes out. Um, that's what we're going to get to, co-regulation. Right? She is the cutest, most delicious <laughs> little thing, and she is a little star right now. Mm. Right? But she was delayed from minute one. Severe allergies, severe reflux, 
always <coughs> vomiting. We didn't realize that she had fluid. Nobody let us know she had fluid in her ears because oh, there was never any ear infection. And, and it turns out she couldn't hear. She had like severe hearing loss till she was 13 months old. I mean, take a child like that. It's no wonder that she was so frustrated. And that's really where the co we were able to pinpoint the cause because it was so clear. It was right there. A parent who tells me the child is in the NICU. I mean, it's like, okay, that's what we call postnatal trauma, right? You know, that's a big, a big cause. It reflux only because if a child's always in pain, the body's getting the message of I'm not safe. And that can impair attachment, not because there's something's up with us. We just can't meet their needs and make them feel safe, if you get what I mean. Okay? Now let's look at this. Techniques are co-regulation. We'll get to all these definitions. Validation. Right brain, left brain connection. No reassurance to the anxiety. And consistent boundaries. Got that? Okay? This is like, and if we're going to take that, we're going to talk about those, but if I wanted to go into each one of these in depth, we'd have a whole two-hour class. Let me just, let me move forward, right, for, for, for two minutes, and let's pick the ones that I think are most, uh, okay. Number one is validation. It is okay to have failings. Did you know that? It's amazing. It's okay to feel anxious. It's okay to cry. It's okay to get upset. What's not okay is to kick somebody. But it's okay to have feelings, and we have to let our kids know that. Right? You're so sad. Let me see if this is even up there. Um, let me go to this first. Let's talk about the adult self versus the child self. Let's talk about these steps. What are you going to do in the moment? We have five steps. Step number one, okay? And I want you all to picture two hats. You're holding two caps, okay? My cap is red and blue. My adult cap is red. My child cap is blue. What colors are yours? Help me out are your caps. Picture two caps. One is labeled adult and one is labeled child. Okay, go for it. Somebody give me what you're thinking. What colors would you use for your hat? Because we're going to switch hats. Purple. purple. Purple and what? Purple is what? Adult or child? No. So we need, we need two hats. An adult hat and a child hat. So one is purple and one is pink. Okay? Everybody picture your own hats. One is labeled adult, one is labeled child. Think of yourselves right now in this moment. Which hat are you wearing on your head? The adult hat. Right now I'm wearing my red hat on my head. Okay, I'm wearing a cap. When I get upset, right, and my kid is nagging at me, and I'm like, stop it! What's that? Child. My child self. I'm wearing my blue hat. Okay? We all have our moments where we're the adult and we're the child. We just do. We're human. It's who we are. But when we're dealing with a child, we need to remember they only have a child hat. We have both. So sometimes what's helpful is to visualize yourself really, you're feeling in the moment. Visualize yourself taking off that child hat, which is giving you all these frustrated feelings of this child is impossible. I can't. I can't deal with this. What am I going to do? Right? Just stop it already and put on the adult hat. And one thing I like to say is we're going to validate our kids. We need to validate ourselves. Okay? And let's tell ourselves, you know what? Little Esty, I'll get to you in a minute. I'll deal with you. I promise I'll deal with you. I will vent. I will kick. I will scream. Whatever you want to do, I will deal with you. Right now, i got to be the adult Esty. Okay? That's number one. Number two is get down to eye level and use a soft tone of voice. If you were anxious and I went, what's the matter with you? Right? What would you feel? More anxious. But if I went, what's wrong? What's the matter? What does it make you feel? Calm. Calm. Right? So literally, you're getting down to eye level, right? And you're saying, what happened? See that? What happened? And what kids tend to do, natural gaze, if they're going to avert your gaze and avoid it, natural gaze is to go down. Uh -huh. So I like to get a little bit beneath them, right? So if I'm going to go here a little bit beneath them, so that way even if they try to avoid my eye contact, they can't. Because I'm here. They're going to get something, even if they look to the side. Because I can just <laughs> follow them. Now, here's the thing. If they're really not going to look at you, you just stay there. What happens is, don't force the eye contact, but they're going to kind of flit in and out. It's just what happens. They're going to flit in and out, and they're going to get some. Okay? And use a soft tone of voice. You ever heard those people say, the, qui the quieter my mother's voice got, the more scared I got? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Okay? This is where we talk about co-regulation. If you can get yourself calm, you know what's going to happen. Your child's going to calm down. It's amazing. It's incredible. I think about the environment in the house, too. Because if I'm so anxious, what's everybody else going to be? It's like, stop punching your sister! What's
what's your kid gonna do? Punch you in the nose. <laughs> you're so sad, you're so angry. And you really wanted to hit your sister because that made you feel better. But we can't hit. What's the difference? Right? Just think about that. Calm tone of voice. We're using ourselves to calm them down. Let's go to the next one. Put the event into words. Okay? You ever have that you're just feeling so overwhelmed <laughs> that you don't even know what you're feeling? And you pick up the phone and you call a friend and you're like, I don't know what I'm feeling. I can't tell you what I'm feeling, but help. Right? And we just like burst into tears. Anyone ever had that? Yeah. Right? Okay. Right? So think about it. When you talk it through what happens, your friend helps you sort it through and put it into words. And how do you feel after? Better. Much better. Remember that image of the brain that we had? Right? Right brain, left brain? <laughs> Our right brain is all emotions. Kind of all these big feelings, boundaryless, like just overwhelming big things. Our left brain is logic and lists and language and limits, right? Our left brain is very organized. Our right brain is not. Our right brain is creative, it's a mess, okay? So you take these two. Emotions are happening here. And if you put it into words, it'll make them feel so much better. Because all the kid knows is somebody came over to me. I'm always anxious, so I'm always in a state of fight or flight. I always feel like everything's unsafe, okay? My sibling just came over to me and, oh, he's probably gonna, I don't know what, but it's going to be dangerous, whatever it is, because everything's always dangerous, right? Boom, whack him in the face. So if you put it into words, oh, you saw that Molly came over to you, and she, you thought she was going to take away your toy, and you, you got so angry. Oh, that's what happened. Put the, put the experience into words. That's number three. Number four is put the feeling into words. The... Ah, that the child is doing. They're throwing a tantrum, and what are you going to say? Oh, you're so sad. Put it into words. What that also helps them do is it gives them an emotional vocabulary. It's, it gives them... It doesn't work with teenagers. They don't want to express their feelings. They don't want to say how they, how they feel. But when, it's true. But when you verbalize it for them, right, right in a tone, and you've you got to match their tone. Mm -hmm. So with teenagers, it's going to be different. Right. You're really, really, really angry that whatever happened. Right? It's not going to be you're not getting down to their eye level. You're not, no, no. You're kind of maintaining that distance. You're mirroring them. It's what we call mirror neurons. You're mir you, your state, you're going to mirror their state so that they can mirror your calm state. Right. Okay? Right. You're going to mirror them. But you're still going to put it into words. Because it's going to help them make sense out of it. Even if in the moment it's not going to diffuse them, right. when they go later on and they process it, your words are going to be there to help them process it and work through it. Later. Yep. Resistance. Oh, yeah. Label their emotions into words. And if you're not. Absolutely. And what I would do in that case is I wouldn't say you are feeling. How do you know what I'm feeling? It looks like you're feeling. I wonder if you're so sad. Mm, seems to me like you're so sad. Yeah. Right? So kind of put that. Listen, I'm the adult. I kind of know what you're feeling, but, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, kind of thing. Right? I How think. Much you give them to try to verbalize? It depends on the kid. So hard to answer. You know, it depends on the kid and how long to give them to verbalize that. And then the last piece is set the boundary. Now it's, but we can't hit. <laughs> but we can't hit. But we can't hit. I needed to have the consequence for that. So I, we are like way, 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 way over time. Okay? I wanted to give you time. Yeah, we're like almost 10 minutes over time. We're like way over time. Um, the number, w number five is set the boundary. You're going to do it calmly. And there is a difference between setting a boundary when you're angry because you're angry and you're setting the boundary, right? I told you no hitting! And between we can't hit. We just can't hit, right? Doesn't it come out so different? So, th and that's how we want now. This is all very nice and dandy in theory, right? I know what you're thinking. You're like, <laughs> very nice. Thanks very much, right? This is not very helpful. Here's the thing. Awareness is step number one. If you're aware and you could take tiny components from this and input it when you can, 
slowly over time, you'll see you're able to put more and more and more in. And as you see it helping and you see it working, it pushes you to do more. So if you kind of take this and you practice this and you, you're aware and you catch yourself in the moment, right? That's step number one. That's better than you were yesterday. That's a better response. We're not looking for perfection. We're looking for awareness because awareness is what helps us change it. Realize that children love boundaries and that boundaries really, really do make children feel very, very safe and confined. And they like that feeling as much as they might give you pushback because in the moment they don't want to be told what to do and they're anxious and they're upset and they're going to get back at you and whatever it is. At the end of the day, if you do it consistently and you do it calmly and you do it lovingly, we always say the first week or two it gets worse. After that it gets better because they really, really mold into it. No hitting. And what we do is, this again, this moves into a whole other course, but we talk about zero tolerance behaviors. Zero tolerance behaviors are behaviors that harm themselves or harm others. Biting, Biting hitting, kicking, whatever it is. Zero tolerance behaviors, if there's a zero tolerance behavior, right, what we typically will say is you, p you pick the child up, very calmly move them to another place, and you close the door. And from outside the door, if you can't be in the room with them, if you could be in the room with them, great. If you can't, you close the door. And from outside the door, this is what you're doing. You're validating them. You're putting it into words. It's OK to feel. You're letting them know what you saw happened. And you're setting the, but we can't hit. I know how upset you are. You're so angry your sister knocked down your tower. And you hit her because you were so angry, but we're not allowed to hit. You're so angry. They'll hear you because they'll start to You repeat it like a broken tape recorder, and they'll hear you. Through the door, they'll hear you. <laughs> Which gets me even more. Yeah. It's frustrating. It's very frustrating. It's very frustrating to deal with children that are anxious. What happens when they're not hitting, they're not doing, they're just like crying over yeah. something and can't regulate themselves to okay. calm themselves down? So if, if you step in and you regulate them to come, if they allow you next to them, that's where you go and you do the sitting next yeah, to them. But the, I'm saying like my daughter, uh, 11, would, will even say, I, I, I knew I, was, I you know, even when I wasn't feeling upset anymore, I just couldn't, I kept crying. You know, like she, she sees it and she just can't. She has to process it. Just keep, you keep processing it. it. Just keep processing it. Keep processing it. It makes me wonder where, where is her, kind of, where is her cup up to, quote unquote. Right. You know? We, technically we're done. Okay, any of you that want to go, please do. Um, but I, I'll stay here and answer questions. Yeah, go ahead. I'm listening. You got to give them space. That's so where that space is helpful. Just give them space. It's just real. So you say down, just that. You are so tired because your day was so long and it's just hard to sit in school all day and I get that. I would also be tired if I were you. You're right, I'd also come home like this. So now what? So now what? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Validating. When you feel, if you're upset. It, first of all, it'll help them process. So they're not gonna build, you know how when you're upset, if somebody comes here and says, don't, don't feel upset, what's wrong with you, right? It makes you feel even more angry. But if somebody validates you, what does it do? It calms it just a little bit. No, but It'll satisfy them. My schedule them. is so crazy. I'm going to do something to change it so that it's not so crazy. You know what I mean? So, but they can't. They they have to. They can't. So like either it's a question of why do they feel like it's so grueling. Usually, if they feel like it's so grueling that it's just pushing them to the limits, there's something there that right. they're that they're the cracks, meaning they're they've compensated right. thus they far and they're starting to fall apart. Right? There's something there that's starting to make them fall apart. And usually it's more than just not going to sleep early enough or something like that. But um, just by validating them, you're kind of <laughs> taking the ear out of the balloon. You diffuse them in the moment. You may, and you can tell them, I wish I could help you, but I can't fix that. But I know how you feel. Just being there for them, giving them that safety net and that security and that support. Yeah. What if you realize, yes, there is an underlying problem. Someone is Something happened in school, and they say, yes, yeah, something happened in school, and then that's it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to tell you what it is, and they just kind of close off. 
then how do you... I would validate, so if they just close off and you know that something happened in school, I would validate the feeling. I would validate, oh, something happened that made you feel really upset, that made you feel really sad or hurt, whatever the emotion is. And if they close off and they won't talk about it, you could say, you know, m you know, it's so hard for me to see you so sad. I don't like to see you sad. It's okay to feel sad and mommy's here whenever you want to talk. And if they don't, you just... If they don't, as long as they know that you're there. And it's better than the opposite of, what's wrong with you? Why are you so angry, right? So if we have, we, we can't fix the problem. There are times where we can't fix the problem, right? Think about it, there are times where people can't fix the problems for us. But if we know that somebody's there for us, it makes it easier for us to tolerate it. Yeah? Okay, um, that's a good question. <laughs> so it's a good question, meaning I don't know what exercises they're doing, right? It's hard for me to say. Okay. You're going into you're going into an area that's kind of a, a, a pet peeve, a frustration for me, uh, you know, because I feel like people don't understand the depths of it. The sensory exercises, the sensory things often are a band-aid. And if they're not done right, also they don't help. And a lot of people don't understand how they work and what they work and really the whys and the neuroscience behind it, right? It's when you get down to the meat and potatoes of it. So it can help them cope throughout their day and it can last quite a number of weeks. It can if it's done right. But to really, really address the underlying issue, there's more that needs to be done. So yes, can it help? Can sensory exercises help during the day? If you have an OT that really understands what they're doing and understands what the issues are and what they're inputting and why they're doing it and what they're targeting and what they're addressing and they understand the full picture, yes, they can be helpful in coping. They really, really, really can. Understand though, often though there's an issue underlying that. That's blocking, that's the reason that they're not processing the information properly. I think they need all that more, those exercises, whether calming or alerting, to help them out. There's something underneath that.